those of us who are trying to write, I, I think, uh, find it daunting to muster up the discipline to write, to do our jobs, and then we're, we find there's this whole other thing that we have to worry about, think about, do, that we may not have the skills or training for, which is marketing our books. I don't want to talk very long because we have, these, we have distinguished panelists who have a lot to share, who have a lot of experience and expertise with this. So I thought the way we'd run this morning's session is each of them will introduce themselves. Um, a couple of them don't have tents in front of them, so you don't see their names. They're De Debbie Applegate and Yen Chun. But everybody, each of the panelists will introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about how they came to this area of expertise. And, uh, and then we will open the floor for questions. We really want to know what's on your minds. So let's begin with Lisa. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Warren. I'm the Vice President, Senior Director of Publicity and Acquiring Editor at DeCapo Press, which is part of the Perseus Books Group. We're based in Cambridge. We publish about 100, 150 books a year, all nonfiction, and we do a whole lot of biographies, um, everything from biographies of military history folks to um, Shakespeare and forger William Henry Ireland to uh, Jack Kerouac to various and sundry musicians. Occasionally we even do a biography of a band like the Supremes. Um, I've been working in publishing for about 15 years. Prior to my time at Perseus, I was at Houghton Mifflin, and prior to that I was at David R. Godin, a very fine independent press here in Boston. Um, one piece of advice that I would have for authors is start thinking about how you're going to publicize your book and marketing your book even at the proposal stage, which of course seems a little odd. Um, you're worried at this point about how you're going to organize the material in your book, what your title and subtitle might be, um, you know, what exactly is going to go where in terms of the structure of the book and the narrative of the book, but you really do have to start building your platform very early on in order to get a book accepted for publication. There are a variety of ways that you can do that. You're off to a good start already affiliating yourself with this organization, um, knowing that you have this group of fellow biographers to tap into when it comes to be time to promote your book is something that a publishing house would certainly notice. Um, but there are other things that you can do. For example, you could start a blog or you could start a website that focuses on the art of biography, that focuses on the person who you're doing a biography of. Uh, you could also start getting used to using social media like Facebook and Twitter because when it comes time to actually promote your book once it has hit bookstore shelves, it is really important that you get the word out about the book and social media is an excellent, excellent way to do that. So if there are articles that you see in newspapers or magazines that are related to the topic of your biography, go ahead and tweet that to people or go ahead and, and let folks know, blog about it. It is truly never too early to start. Another thing that you can do to really build that proposal up a bit and, and help yourself out is to come up with a marketing and publicity plan for the book. Now, of course, if you publish with a, a trade press, you're going to have a person there who does the publicity for you, and you're going to have a person there who does the marketing for you. So don't anticipate that you're going to have to figure all of it out yourself. But we like to see when we're sitting there at that editorial board meeting that you have some ideas, that you bring some ideas to the table, and also that you bring some connections to the table. So any members of the media who you know, whether it's your spouse or a high school chum or a friend of a friend or someone who's just interviewed you in the past, even if it's a few years ago, be sure that you're including them in your proposal. Let the editor know that you do have some connections that you can use, some favors that you can call in when it comes to be time to promote your book or even if you don't have connections at media outlets, if you can even just provide a list of shows and publications that you think might be interested in your book, even if it's an academic journal, that helps us to see that you are already thinking about where reviews of your book could run, where profile pieces about you could run. You know, list your hometown paper as a possibility for a profile piece. Um, it's also really, imperative at, at this stage of the game that you start thinking about how the book is going to be marketed. What grassroots groups are out there, what organizations are out there that might be interested in hearing about your book. If you're doing a biography of James Monroe and there is some sort of founding fathers of America organization, you'd want to be sure to include the name of that organization and a link to its website in the proposal for your book. 
So start gathering, use the skills that you've developed to do research, to research the shows and publications and organizations that might be able to support your book. And that will help to convince a prospective editor that you know what you're doing and also will demonstrate to us that you are going to partner with us to promote that book, that you're not looking to be the recipient of our publicity campaign or the recipient of our marketing campaign, but that you will work. You're not going to stop working when you turn that final manuscript in. You're going to start working. <laughs> May I suggest you use the mic? Ah, is there a mic? Oh. Are these mics? Yeah. I think they are. They're not very easy to do. Yeah. Sorry, 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 gosh. <laughs> if you can bump up the volume for us. Would you like us to stand while we speak? This is, not, this is attached here. Ah, okay. Um, well, maybe just for, uh, I'll, uh, I'll speak. Okay, that's fine. Um, my name's Debbie Applegate. I, I come from a very different perspective, which is I am a complete blue stocking who only entered this profession because I don't like selling. I mean, why would I be a historian if I like to sell? Um, but on the other hand, I did have that desperate feeling of I worked on this book for seven plus years. More, more, really more uh, years, and I had that desperate feeling. Well, if nobody, nobody, the, the publishers won't. They want to do their best, and they will do their best. But they have dozens of other books, and it, it's not in there. It, you know, it's your baby. Uh, they are just the governess uh, <laughs> for a little while, and uh, and so I, I happen to live with my husband, who I keep mentioning, uh, he because he's here. Uh, he not in the room though, so I can say anything. He is very entrepreneurial, so he made me sit down and do. Nobody had told me that it is. No, your your publicist will not tell you this. Your publicist will say, oh, it'll all be great and make you feel good, and you'll come home feeling like, oh my God, for the first time in my life, someone's taking care of my interests, and then it won't be their fault, but not much will happen. So, um, I, so I, I, I'm sure we'll talk about specific things, list making, because I would say, she, what you just said, Alyssa, sounds so good. If you have a bunch of reporters you know, and if you've been interviewed in a number of places, and you know there are people interested in your topic. Uh, my topic happened to be a philandering Calvinist minister who had been long forgotten. So there were no natural, in my mind, I didn't have any reporters who were beating down my door to ask me about that. So um, I, I want to say two, I would speak to two things. First is um, the real, starting as a real rank amateur, that so the techniques maybe of starting as a rank amateur, but I would first want to say a thing about sort of philosophically how to approach the publication of your book and marketing. There is just no way that every biography that is published is going to be a bestseller, um, that, or that is going to. There is almost no way that most books that are published are going to be economically successful enough to support you. It is a lousy way to make a living, as we all know. So you have to, dis so you, and you should go for the brass ring and hope for the bestseller and hope that you will get the kind of financial recompense you hope you want. But I think it's very important to decide, well, what will success look for and look like for this particular book? What does success look like for this subject and what does success look like for me as, uh, the, person, as the person who's pursuing a career? Um, because a book can do a lot of things uh, even if it can't feed you. Um, it can uh, m make you an expert that then allows you to go and pursue other professional possibilities. Um, it, can make you, um, uh, it can make you a known enough name that then you can pursue other writing possibilities, whether, uh, whether it's short you know, assignments like journalism or the chance, frankly, just to write another book. For many people, that alone is what they want, the chance to continue in their profession. For others, um, if you are particularly devoted to your topic, perhaps success in your is making your topic much better known. Perhaps it is something particularly devoted to an institution. Um, there are a lot of ways to define success, and it's very important to know what that will look like for you, because then you can decide what lists you're going to pursue. Then you can decide where you're going to go. Um, so that's, I think, the most important thing is to rec to think about that question. Um, and then the second, I, I, then I, I think I'm going to move on and let people talk, because the things that I have to suggest are things like, one thing that will make it, for example, one thing that really will make it feel successful, that will make this, that will reward you psychologically for those seven to 20 to 10 years of work or however much you did, is feeling like the rollout of the book itself happened well. Most books don't have a very long life, but if they don't get any attention when they come out, you feel terrible. 
uh, and you really have done a disservice to your subject and to all the work you did. So the first thing I would say, and then I'll move on because we can talk about how to keep um, a, a marketing, a self-paced marketing program going, but is deciding what you're going to do for that month that first week, those first days, and that first month or two to make sure you feel like you did everything you could. And that includes lining up speaking engagements. It's hard if you don't have a lot of money because no one's going to pay you to drive around the country aside. But finding the institutions uh, that will ask you to speak based on your subject, based on uh, your particular connections, your interests. Uh, frankly, for me, it turned out Calvinist churches, lots of them, who knew? And they actually were willing to have me come speak. Uh, um, uh, there were lots of, there were Calvinist blogs, who knew? Um, and, and so, in fact, I spent, month, I spent a good month trolling the internet, learning about these subcategories of people I didn't know. Turns out there are adulterer websites, that too, very handy. I mean, things that, that you wouldn't know, Careful, so you can start to say, I mean, bra the brainstorming process is really important, and it helps if you brainstorm around the, the rollout, it gives you just enough specificity and just enough broadness to think, all right, who's going to have me come speak? Which historical society? Which, by, you know, which foundation? Which, you know, uh, which church? Whatever it is. And, and I, arranged, I arranged six speaking engagements at various historical societies. Not one of them paid me, but, I, but because then I worked, I invited everyone I knew. I invited everyone I knew 10 times. At each place, I had crowds between 25 to 70 people. And they bought enough books for my publisher to feel like, all right, we'll put a little more energy into this. And they created enough buzz that some people put it in there. It, just getting in, so, OK, so sorry. I'm not being organized. So one thing is thinking about the, what the rollout will look like. Who's going to cut? Who, who might cover it? I, I think this is my set last philosophical point, which is I think a book, to go back to the original point about success, what matters is success, is I think it should be a little like a political campaign. You don't always win. You do not always take the vote, you know, win in the office. But what you have done often is set yourself up. How do you set yourself up? By a campaign of touching people. Not everyone's going to buy your book. And, and even all the people who read your book probably will not all buy your book because they will use libraries or they will buy it used or they will borrow it from people. What you want to do is give people the opportunity, people who you think might be interested in your book, the opportunity to run across your name and title as many possible, as many possible times as that they can. So that means you want to be in newsletters. You want to be in the local historical society's newsletters. You want to be in the local arts papers newsletter. You want to have it. You want to be speaking at a, at your local library, just so even if they don't come see you, they have now seen you five times in the newspaper saying you're going to be around. Uh, that sort of thing, so that then people feel like, okay, you are now. I cannot tell you the peacock effect of being an author of no. How many people have read about Henry Ward Beecher? Really very few, but a whole bunch of people feel that they have heard about that book. And that alone has given me the ability to do other things. So I will stop as I keep threatening to stop. And then on Dan, who really wrote a book about so many people care about. Uh. <laughs> so many people <clears throat> care about rather negatively. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> Doesn't hurt. Nothing. Um, controversial hurts. Um, I was in a very different uh, position. I, I, I'm the author of Ayn Rand and the World She Made. That's my first book, my first biography. And it's the first um, biography of Ayn Rand that wasn't written by a follower or a Ayn Rand hater. Mm -hmm. Actually, there, there haven't been any biographies except one by a very close follower of Rand's. And um, I had a very good publisher, very good editor. Um, and I expected this to be easy. Um, and uh, did not prepare, as uh, our experts here are suggesting that we all do. And, and uh, now I know how important that is. Um, while I was uh, delivering the manuscript and waiting for the various stages of production to begin, uh, my publishing house was my editor's imprint was went from about 12 people to, to three people. Her, the, the publicity person who was assigned to her and with whom she had worked for a long time was fired. And she shared, a, began to share a publicity person who she didn't know, who was very young, and who, um, while she was Good. I mean, I think she they, they, she tried as hard as she could 
Um, this was probably not her kind of book. And I think, uh, not to, for, for the editors and publicity people in the room, I, I think they're wonderful, very entrepreneurial and active publicity people in many places, small and large. But um, I had the feeling about this woman, as somebody else who also used her said, that she was on the phone with you, but she had her wedding planner on hold over here. Oh. <laughs> um, she had a checklist, and I could, you know, I could feel the checklist over the telephone. And uh, once she had checked things off, she was not interested in anything else that I had to suggest or say. She had a limited time to do this. Um, if I had started early, I would have worked with her much more happily. So that's that. She had radio contacts, and that was really helpful. I think the radio is wonderful. Huge. Especially NPR. NPR, wonderful. And even if it doesn't sell too many books, the ability to talk about your book that it trains you for, it's huge. It's huge. You can do it sitting you know, at your uh, kitchen table all around the country. Um, and you can get national exposure that way. And um, public radio stations in particular are very eager to cover the kinds of subjects that we write about. Did she set up your radio contact? M many of them, yeah. Because I actually hired somebody for yes. about $1,000 to do yes. that. Yes, you can do that. And next time I um, write a book of this kind, um, I'm going to hire somebody to do some of these yeah. things. It's called I the Radio Satellite Tour, and there are a lot of companies that do them pretty affordably and will guarantee at least 20 or 25 interviews for you. There's one right here in Boston called Newman Communications. It's quite good. So if you have the cash to spare, Newman Communications, and there are others in other cities too. Would you say if you have a little cash that that's where I you think it's a it? fabulous use of it, and I will tell you as an in-house publicist, you know, we, we are somewhat territorial. We don't want just anyone pitching your book to the media, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. if someone, if, if an author freelances out a radio satellite tour, we know that that is really not going to conflict a whole lot with our efforts. Um, and that they will use the press material that we provide to them, so we'll feel confident that the book is being presented in the right way. Um, it's a, a very good use of an author's money. Um, and uh, as you um, speak uh, to the audience at one radio program, uh, other people, other radio people come to you. It really has a very cumulative effect, the same way that book reviews do. And um, my impression, is that uh, radio interviews sell books. Um, but that's just my impression. It's true. Um, uh, I think that print um, sells fewer books. That's my impression. I got a tremendous amount of print publicity. And it was very gratifying in the way that, um, that Debbie is talking about. I did feel that, you know, not, no, uh, that, that this was about as good as it could get in terms of print. But I, I think that uh, that was by far not enough. It used to be. It used to be the way people bought books. I don't think people buy books that way anymore. Or at least um, the people who do are perhaps older than um, the people who don't. Um, so there's a whole bunch of interested people out there who don't um, necessarily buy books unless they're online and um, they can press a button. Um, and in, in the end, I ended up using a, an internet marketing person, very good mm. person, named uh, Ken Gillette uh, in New York at Target Marketing, who specializes only in internet marketing of books. And um, his idea is that the platform, as you were saying, you find your audience most easily on the web. You can search all sorts of things. You can uh, list blogs and websites and make sure that you offer to write for those websites and blogs, that you propose yourself for an interview, you send them um, copies of the covers of your books. Um, and he did a ma miraculous job of that for me. And um, I don't know what I would have done without him. Is that expensive? It was $2,000. For how long? For six weeks. And then I, I kept him on for a, a couple of months longer. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Yen Chiang. I'm the Associate Director of Digital Media and Publicity at Viking Penguin. And um, I was actually a history major in college, and I think this is the first time that I've actually been in a room <laughs> full of historians. <laughs> <laughs> Gratifying. Um, and um, a couple years ago, I started the book publicity blog. And if you go online, you just Google book publicity and you can pull up the blog. In part because of what Debbie was saying a little earlier today, where there's not a lot of information out there about how to promote and market books, although Lissa did write a great book on how to do just this, mm -hmm. and but you know, given that it's been changing so much, I thought it'd be helpful. Initially, I thought it would be helpful for my own department and perhaps other publicists to sort of categorize information and just archive it really so that if anyone had a question I could just direct them there and I found that actually quite a lot of authors were coming onto the site so I do have a lot of information about um, marketing a book online about social networking I did at one point also compile a list of book free uh, book publicity freelancers so if on the site you search for freelance publicist or book publicist you'll pull up a list of many different firms and also free just people on their own, including Newman Communications, which you may find helpful. Um, and I think one thing that is certain is that book marketing and publicity has changed so much over the last few years. Um, so that's something that we're still sort of all, I think, trying to work out, see what works, see what doesn't. I would definitely agree with Lissa and say that it's never too early to start thinking about your platform, meaning who you're going to try to reach. I think Debbie brought up a good point when she says that you know, she's not exactly walking down the street reeling off the names of reporters interested in Henry Beecher, <laughs> whereas we know someone like David Remnick writing about Obama, you know he is. But I think one of the purposes of this panel is to help everyone figure out who can you reach, whether you're writing about Henry Beecher or Obama. Can you say what that site is again? Please? It's called the Book Publicity Blog, and it has kind of a weird URL, so the easiest way to reach it is just to Google Book Publicity, and then you'll pull up the Book Publicity Blog. My voice is going, so I'm going to go over there. <laughs> That's more dignified, Boo. <laughs> I'm James Bradley, and I wrote uh, Flags of Our Fathers and Flyboys and the Imperial Cruise over the last uh, 10 years. Um, in terms of marketing a book, I think it's important you look at the market. Look at the word, market. You know, I think a lot of authors are continue to look at their work, and you've got to, you, you've, you've got to look at the market. Let me say something. 15 minutes on the phone will save you 15% on your insurance. Do you know where that comes from? Yes, you do. It's from Geico, right? And how long did they think about getting that simple tagline? How long have you thought about the simple one or two sentence pitch for your book? You look at why Fox News is number one, right? Why don't you turn it on? I don't care if you like it or not. Why is it number one? They're saying simple things. They're saying simple things simply. Say simple things simply. You do not have time to tell the story about your book. Look at my first book, Watch the Pitch. My dad raised the flag on Iwo Jima. He never talked about it. This is the story. Here's my second book. <laughs> eight, guys got, eight guys got their heads cut off on the island of Chichijima right next to Iwo Jima and their parents never knew what happened to him, them. This is the secret story. You got five sentences to say? Get on, I mean, you're not gonna get on the radio or TV. No one's got any time for you, I'm sorry. You have a lot of time to say words like this? Oh, uh, th uh, thank you very much for uh, having me to the, it's my pleasure to thank you very much for the, I mean, wh what? <laughs> you know? That uh, Churchill said, "Opening uh, amenities are opening inanities." <laughs> get, get, you know. But but look at the market. 
you are not watching shows where it's old 19th century author stuff. You know, I'm very happy to whatever, and the, you know, it's my pleasure to, you know, what's the bottom line here? What are you selling? 15 minutes online will save you 15%. You have to be able to say something like that about your books. Now, I asked Stephen Ambrose, the author, once, you know, how do you sell a book? And he said, write a good one. <laughs> so so you, 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 can't get a, you can't get away uh, from that. But let's say you already have written a good book. Um, you've got to kiss it. Keep it simple, stupid, or they will tell you to kiss off. You have to be able to go into the proposal. I used to be in a, uh, in a business where we made multi-million dollar pitches. And the pitches would be 15, 20 pages, and they'd involve sets and film and speeches and all these wonderful elements. Well, I used to conceive of the pitch and tell people, look it, you, you're going to give a 45-minute, like $2 million pitch here, but really what you need to do is to be able to pitch it in the sense that somebody in your pitch audience will go to the next office and over coffee, you know, what was that about? And they'll give a one-liner. That's it. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you. You work one year or eight years on a book, you know, uh, so what to the people down the office at the coffee thing? What's the one sentence they're going to say? Oh, we're in this pitch and the book is about blank. You know, what do you want? I mean, that's about all the time you get in this media market as they're looking at their phones and the TV and the, I you know, What's your what's your what's your one what's your one picture? For flags of our fathers, I I rehearsed for three weeks before I went out on on a book tour. My latest book, The Imperial Cruise, I rehearsed for almost four weeks. Now that wasn't twelve hours a day, but every morning I got up and I rehearsed, and I and I hired somebody to rehearse me to read the book and tell me what is this book about. That first line, what are the first five words you're going to say to a publisher or to the, uh, your next door neighbor or in that radio interview? It can't be. See, you don't know where Geico's located. <laughs> no, but you don't. You don't know what the name stands for. You don't know who the president is. They don't give you all that gobbledygook. They give you the 15 minutes and 15%. So upfront your value. You know, get it down. And the only way you can do that is we, we re with rehearsal. Now, I'd like to talk about the difference between being an author and being a speaker. Authors will write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and make that great. But you know what? They won't do the same when it comes to speaking. They will do something called reading. And reading is a great, I'm sorry, reading is a, g <laughs> reading, no, I'm sorry, reading, reading is a great way to kill an audience and make sure that you will never, b I mean, come on, you just spend seven years on something and you can't look at the audience and talk about it with passion, when those guys get uh, beheaded on the island of Iwo Jima, I've rehearsed it, my father was one of the guys who raised the flag. Well, a telegram came back to Kentucky to the general store, and a barefoot boy ran that telegram through the Kentucky hills. That took me hours and hours and hours of rehearsal to be able to get that stuff. See, you will rewrite. You will rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and spend hours, but will you use your mouth and speak aloud the words that you will use on the radio or TV? Well, I don't have any TV and radio book. Well, there's a reason why, because you're not spending the hours of, of honing it down. You have to hear yourself. You cannot think out a speech. Don't write a speech unless you almost have to be at the level of Obama to read a speech and have emotion come through. What can you say on your feet? Say it over and over to the mirror. It's more painful than writing, I guarantee you. It's very, very difficult, and I don't enjoy it. But I do, but I do it, be, you know, so that you can get to the point where you're not, you know, reading and oh my God. So you can be an author. Speaking is completely different. Rehearse. Read books on how to speak. You're reading books on how to market a book. You're reading books on how to write a book. 
Read books on how to give a speech. Ed McMahon, I think, has the best book. It's about 80 pages. I just gave a speech last night to 300 people, and you know, I pulled out Ed McMahon's book to organize that speech. I've been doing it for 25 years with, it, with, that, with, with that book. Study, sp uh, study speaking. By the way, last night, there were about uh, seven speakers at this, uh, at this so society, and uh, six of them read their speeches, some of them from teleprompters. You know, they have to read off a tele... Thank you very much for the honor of... I mean, what is that? And the audience can feel it. You know, step out from the podium. Give some drama. Give the emotion that you have uh, put into that book. So as you rewrite and rewrite to make that book perfect, rehearse, allow, and be able to transfer that, uh, transfer that emotion. After you get done with that radio, TV interview, that pitch, what is that person who really doesn't care that much about you or the idea when they walk down the hall? What's the one-liner? That's your job, to get that one-liner into that second, third, fourth, fifth person down the line uh, to sell the book. So do as much work on your presentation as you do on your book, and uh, people will buy. got a lot of great ideas from this half hour of listening to these experts on marketing from different perspectives. So now we'll take questions. We want to know what you're interested in learning. Yes. I joined three different Toastmasters before I started writing, three different times. I want to say I am somebody who does read my speech. Basically, I do the same speech over and over. But it's just as pra you can. Re he is totally right, and it's a shame that I do. But you can do it. You just have to practice, so you don't feel like you have to memorize or you have to go different. You just have to do what he said. That's, that's <laughs> right. And in fact, it does make a difference. I have been. I probably have spoken four times more than I would have only because people saw me speak. And give them the chance to see you speak, have someone videotape your talk, mm. put it on YouTube, yeah. or put a link to it on your website. Publicity begets publicity, so you give a good talk, you'll get invited to give more good talks. Because they're rare. Can you tell us about Toastmasters? Oh, sure. So the Toastmasters is an international organization that helps you improve your communication and leadership and that there's a basic program and advanced programs. And through the basic program, you will learn everything from organizing your speech, to using your body, to improving your voice quality, to inspiring your audiences. Advanced uh, tracks can help you communicate on TV and will involve some videotaping, et cetera. And people do, I've had many, many people come up and say, I wasn't going to buy the book, I just came for the talk, free talk, and, and bought, I mean, it does, many, many people, it does sell books, it really does. Someone else? Yes. Um, no one mentioned how to get your book It does help sell books, and it also leads to other publicity opportunities. If someone that's in the media reads a review and they're with NPR or with C-SPAN's book TV, they might contact your publicist and ask to, to have you on. Um, it's very hard for authors to get their books reviewed. I do not encourage you, and I'm sure Dan would agree, to reach out to the media directly and say, would you review my book? Um, the best thing that you can do is write a good book and perhaps work with your publicist, your in-house publicist or a freelance publicist if you've gotten a freelance publicist to create good press material, to create a really good press release or even a Q&A, a canned Q&A that would go with that. That way when the book review editors are getting the book, they'll hopefully read a little of the press release, read a little bit of the Q&A, and even just seeing that you've gone to the extra effort of doing a Q&A or you know, being able to tell from the publicist's press release that it's an important book for that house, that will increase the chances that they do assign it for review. Also, make sure your publicist is working really hard to get the four trade reviews um, and the advanced publications, Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, and Booklist, because 
book review editors are watching those publications to see what they review and what they review favorably. The starred reviews, especially. They and really if you miss to. getting, if, uh, I know some Jamie missed, uh, his publicist didn't send his book to uh, one of them, and so it didn't get in, and it made a big difference. Yep. I, um, the Imperial Cruise was reviewed in the New York Times regular newspaper, and then it was also reviewed in uh, the uh, New York Times uh, book review. How many read one or those, one or the other? Okay, so I mean, we're talking about reviews. Now, less, one, only one third of this audience of specialists in the book business even read, the, so I don't know how many I sold with those reviews. But can, may I, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know exactly what that means, but I don't know how, yeah. if these reviews are driving as many books as they, they used get to. more media and also just being able to use quotes from them mm -hmm. on your paperback okay, or there, your press material. There. On your website. Yeah, right. You yeah. printing it up. I do color reproductions of my reviews. You go to the website and you're attacked by all the, the quotes. You know, it's Fox News now. You know, long form reviews. I, I, I don't know. And I think, like Lissa said, publicity begets publicity. So those book review sections, they are read by readers, but they're also read by media people. So if they're going through the New York Times book review and they're seeing what's reviewed there, that can, you know, maybe someone will call up to do an interview or someone will want you to write an op-ed. So that's definitely something you should be And once again, at. I think mm -hmm. that if you know w what your market is, um, if it's historical societies or Calvinist churches, uh, you can try. You can try uh, specifically to talk to those people in a press release um, and send your book out, maybe with a personal note through yeah. the publicist. Could I wait? Could I add on, the, on this? Because I, I felt very well reviewed for an obscure person. I got very good reviews, and I had no idea why. And and I asked my. I finally was sitting with a really fancy editor. And I said, what is it that makes the difference between those books? You get five reviews and those books get none. And she said, you know, you know, you did it. And I said, what, what, what? She said, blurbs, blurbs. And I've, I've confirmed this with every editor I've ever asked. I said, what, okay, blurbs. But nobody told me, go out and get blurbs. So here's where, talk about, I knew nobody, uh, not virtually nobody. Um, and I wrote the most sweetly sycophantish and deeply personal notes to everyone I thought I could possibly get to write this book. Total strangers also used every connection I had to send it to Doris Kearns Goodwin and to send it to, I mean, everybody. And a per and I now get blurb uh, requests for blurbs all the time. And if I know them, I often will do, will give a blurb. If they're a stranger, I often, or an editor who, yeah, yeah, they said, I often will not, but I will blurb books from strangers. If they write me a letter that seems like they really know me, oh, they loved my book, oh, they really care, and their book looks good, I will blurb it. And I will tell you, I, I went out, because my husband made me, I got 12 blurbs from top to bottom, from experts in religion, from experts in sex, from big names to small names that all looked good. It didn't matter if they were all necessarily known, but they all looked good. And I absolutely believe that made the difference. And, and nobody will tell you that. And that's why you start early. You don't have to know anyone. But when you're writing your book five years ahead of time, you're like, who would I want to know? Who would be the person I would want to blurb? Get to know them before you want to ask them a favor. Send them a nice note saying how much you admire their work. And then when you, then four years later, then they might, they're much more likely to write you a blurb. I'm sorry, I cannot. I think it would actually be useful to just quickly go through the publicity and marketing timeline so yeah. that you know what you're looking at. We've all been talking about start early, <coughs> get to know people ahead of time. And so basically that means, as you can have kind of figured out, the publicity process does start relatively early. So about six months, well, four to six months before the book actually comes out, before the publication date, the publishing house will get galleys, so advanced copies of the book. And publicists use this to mail out to the media. So we will be mailing to print reviewers at the daily book review sections. We will also be targeting long lead magazines. Um, the monthly magazines have lead times of, it can be three to four months, so if we don't go out ahead of time, they're not, if we get something to them a month ahead of time, they're not going to do it. 
So we need to get those galleys to them early. We will also target the weeklies. They do have shorter lead times, but we want to kind of get on their radar so they know what's coming up. And we will also mail to some large national broadcast shows. So shows like, you know, these days everyone talks about the Colbert Report and uh, Jon Stewart. We'll mail to them, we'll mail to, if it's appropriate, maybe some of the morning shows, um, some of the cable news shows. Just, again, they may have shorter lead times, but we want to make sure to get the books on their radar. And then, of course, like Lissa was saying, we will be mailing to the four major trade publications. So that's what's happening about four to six months before the book is published. And what's very useful for us to have at this point is any media contacts that any of you might have. And sometimes this may be a lot of media contacts, sometimes it may not be that many. That's okay, but if you do have any contacts, make sure to pass them on to the publicity department ahead of time. And then probably at around three to four months ahead of time, we'll also start <coughs> thinking about setting up any talks. Um, the exception would be very large lecture venues, which will book up nine months to a year ahead of time, although those venues tend to be for authors who can draw a really, really huge crowd. I'm sure James, you've spoken you know, before hundreds, maybe thousands of people. So those are the types of venues that will book up way, way in advance. A typical bookstore will schedule their events anywhere from a month to six months before the actual event. And so then we've, we've mailed to the book editors and the Longley people, we've set up events, and then about six weeks before the book comes out, we'll get the finished book. So this is what you'll see in the stores if we just get it early. And at that point, what we do is we will resend the book to the daily newspapers. At this point, we won't be targeting the long lead magazines because their issues have closed. And then we will also do, we'll do a local mailing to an author's hometown. If the author is going on tour, we'll make sure to mail books to, the, to meet in those tour cities. And then we will also mail books to appropriate radio shows and TV shows. So that's kind of how the publicity rolls out over the few months before the book actually comes out. Social media is an important part of it, and, and Yen, I think, knows even more about social media than I do, but um, Facebook, Twitter, you know, when you get on a radio show, tweet a link to the audio clip of that radio show on the station's website. When you get a TV interview, tweet a link to that. When you're going to be doing an event at a bookstore, you need to put it on your Facebook page that everyone should show up or tweet it so that people know, and then tweet reminders to them closer to the date. Um, so that is certainly you know, an area where we're seeing a lot of growth. Blogs as well, and author websites. I mean, 10 years ago, authors were saying to me, should I do a website? Now it's, you know, my website is done, Lisa, here's a link. I mean, they don't even need to ask anymore. They know every author has to have a website these days. Um, and a lot of them are blogging too. I, I think also it's, it's just become more important for authors to be really involved. Yen mentioned op-eds earlier. You need to be writing op-eds. You need to be watching for those current event hooks that you can maybe massage a little bit in order to have, to give the op-ed editor a reason to run your op-ed now. And you need to be watching for anything in the news that somehow relates to the person you're writing about that you can then tell your publicist about so they can use that as a hook. Um, just to give an example, we are doing a biography of Patrick Henry this fall, and there have been a lot of people at Tea Party movement events who, you know, heralded Patrick Henry as their beacon of light for, for individual rights early on. And, you know, it's like 
I'm holding my author back from writing those op-eds saying, wait till pub date, wait till pub date, or wait till closer to pub date because he's just so poised, so ready to write op-eds that I'll then submit for him. Um, so all of this is to say authors have to be more involved now. They also have to be more connected on the web now. Um, and I will tell you, too, there was a time where, you know, we would send authors on five or ten city tours, and we would be able to get, you know, not only great bookstore events where lots of people came, but also we would be able to get them really good media in each of those markets they went to. Now it's very hard to get people to go to bookstore events, or they go but they don't purchase the book. You know, maybe that's the economy. I don't know what it is. You know, people are just busy these days. Um, and I'm not able to get as much local media in each of those markets when they go. You know, when I call up and tell a, a media outlet, hey, this author is going to be in town, they're like, eh, okay, that's nice. Um, so, you know, you can call into book clubs from your home instead of going to a particular market to do a bookstore event. You can maybe just do bookstore events that are a day trip away for you, and that way you're not having your, pub your publisher isn't having to pay to put you up in all of these places and fly you all over. And because you can, as an author, be so connected via the web, you don't necessarily need all of that FaceTime that you used to have. Some of it is still good, and, and look for those opportunities to, to give talks to real life you know, human beings there in, in the flesh in front of you. But um, you don't have to go around as much as you used to. And, and I just don't think bookstore events are the way that any book is truly made these days. It doesn't hurt, but it, it a book success is not dependent on bookstore events the way it used to be. of you have uh, seen it called Book TV. And Book TV will cover nonfiction talks. They often cover a lot of talks, which is good. And I think actually they have quite a large viewership. We have one editor who had asked a question during one of his Book TV talks. It aired at 3 in the morning. And the next day, she had five calls from friends saying, I saw you on book TV. Oh, yeah. I get emails so, at 2 o'clock in the morning from really unusual yeah. people who I would not have guessed would be interested in this. So I think you have to contact them. They won't contact you. The, I, the I found it totally came. My, the publisher yeah, around the bookstore blur. sometimes mm -hmm. contacts them, too. Um, but it, 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 we see, just to give you a sense of it, if your book is 30000 on Amazon on a Friday night and book TV airs on Saturday, your book will be in all likelihood 3,000 or even less the following day. I mean, it won't last, but <laughs> you will see that spike and you'll have sold several hundred copies because of that one C-SPAN book TV airing. And of course they repeat, which is wonderful. And yes, sometimes it's at 2 a.m. You find out who's so, up at 2 a.m. So is that something your publicist has to do? That's not something Either the, the, the publicist do. or if, the if you, the, yeah, the author can't really do it, but the, the publicist or the bookstore could do it. Or like if you are speaking at the Pritzker Military Library or the National Press Club or um, the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco or some other, the Boston Athenaeum. The Harriet Beecher Stowe They can all reach out to the <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> exactly. yeah. You never know why or where yeah, they're going they to show up. They probably have a publicist <laughs> on staff who could reach out to Book TV, and um, and it's it's well worth doing. I have a question. Going from 30,000 to 3,000 on Amazon.com yep. represents about how many books sold? A few hundred. Really? A few hundred. Okay. Depends on the day, right? It depends on the day. It's all <laughs> relative, yeah. One thing that we've mentioned is that uh, Lissa had said that authors shouldn't really be contacting the media, which is important. They typically respond a little bit better to publicists, or sometimes they don't respond to publicists. Yeah. But they don't really like sort of having someone just spring something on them, so it's better to go through an intermediary. The exception, of course, would be if you actually know someone. So certainly call in all of those favors, talk to your journalist friends, and that's perfectly fine. But if you don't know a journalist, it's much better to have someone from the publishing house or a PR person contact them. I think a good, you know, 
four to six months in advance of the book coming out, that's a great time to launch your website because as Yen showed with her, her timeline demonstration, your publicist is starting to get the word out. Galleys of your book are going out to the media. Those media people might want to hit that website to find out a little bit more about you. Or if your publicist is pitching bookstore events, those bookstores might want to go to your website to find out a little bit more about you. Um, you know, far in advance of that, I don't know that it's going to serve you quite as well. Your time might be better spent getting that edit back to your editor, perhaps. <laughs> Would be good to keep everything on time. But blog participation, I, I kind of, when I started doing, I did it the old-fashioned way. My husband made me sit down and write an old-fashioned packet with a cover. I, I found 200 institutions, Civil War sites, uh, parks, uh, historic homes, anything. I mean, I covered everything related to Henry Ward Beecher. Uh, and so that's important to remember. You've got multiple hooks that you know that may only appear in one chapter, but you know I went to speak in every place I could where I had to say. Um, I did 200 packets of cover, a, spe a, a pretty much individualized, semi-individualized cover letter, um, a one sheet with a picture of me and a cover of the book and a, a bio and the flap copy. Um, and then I might have, I think I might have had something that had places I was speaking or where it had been reviewed, something like that. Now that, and I sent it to gift shops that I thought would cover it. I mean, everything. Now that produced, that produced it being carried in some places, that produced speaking engagements, that produced sort of newsletter touching, rather smaller media. But now, but I really, and I did, and I discovered those places through the web, but I didn't really participate in a blog I didn't like participate. I didn't feed into the. And what I have been told, and I'd be curious to see if you think this is true, that if you that if you want to be an author, so you want to now start putting things onto the arts and crafts websites, it's better to have started that maybe a year early while you're writing your book. Start participating in those communities so that when your book is ready to come out, you are a somewhat known member of that community. You're someone who's already someone who's going to listen to as opposed to just, but I also wonder, I'd be curious to see, I don't want, I mean, obviously they, sending a packet, an old fashioned packet of materials to a website <laughs> by mail would be absurd. What would you recommend as a way to substitute for that? It, it, it really depends on the website and the author. So, you know, certainly there are people who think, well, you can start a year ahead of time or start two years ahead of time, but I think a lot of authors would also say, you know what, I'm working on a book. I can't, <laughs> I can't, can't go to blog and waste my time. <laughs> well, not blogging. I don't so, mean blogging, or but even, like being you know, part of a group right, web thinking community. about all of that. So I think you sort of have to kind of balance it out. Um, and this is going to be pretty individualized. Some authors will say, you know what, I'll... I'll belong to these discussion groups and maybe comment on these blogs and other authors will say, I really need to meet this deadline and I can't really actively do anything until a few months beforehand. Um, so, and then also when it comes to what contacting material, what would you the send? websites, <coughs> this is something where you would have to go to the websites and see how they prefer to be contacted. <coughs> so typically these days it's not by mail. Right. Often bloggers will give an email address. Sometimes they don't give that. I'm sure you've seen that contact form that pops up and so you enter your information. So you just have to see what they prefer. and. Unfortunately, it's a little laborious going to all of those sites, mm -hmm. but it is worth it because the blogger will appreciate your having contacted them in the way that they prefer. Something that I thought of and didn't do and regret now was to publish uh, something on a related topic in a magazine that would be coming out at the same time yeah. that um, uh, the, the book was coming out. For example, uh, Ayn Rand had a much younger lover named Nathaniel Brandon, who is a, he's very old now, he's not very well, uh, the father of the self-esteem movement. And mm -hmm. so he lends himself very well to a magazine profile. And I meant to do that and I didn't, <laughs> but. <laughs> um, Great idea though. Lots yeah. of <laughs> It does establish you as an expert, it puts your name out there and you know, depending on the circulation of the magazine, it can do you some good. I think a, a, a couple comments about uh, blurbs. With Flags of Our Fathers, I contacted everybody, and everybody turned me down. Too busy, too this, too that. Um, and finally, somebody said, contact Stephen Ambrose. Mm -hmm. 
And I said, yeah, maybe I'll write five books and then call Stephen right. Ambrose. I mean, <laughs> you know, but they encouraged me, and I did. And uh, I got a fax from him saying that he was open. And uh, two days later, I was in Stephen Ambrose's home. You know, I was broke, and nobody was thinking this was a good idea, this book. <laughs> but two days later, I was down in uh, New Orleans in his home pitching Stephen Ambrose, and we got a fa fabulous one-line bur blurb that really blew the publisher out of the water. So that took me many, many months. Uh, Flags of Our Fathers had 27 turndowns over 26 months. I pitched that book in New York t for 26 months in a row, did almost nothing other than pitch Flags of Our Fathers, and I got 27 letters from the biggest publishers in the country telling me why this is not a good idea, no one would be interested in it. Yes. I, had publishers, <laughs> I had publishers walk out on the pitch meeting. Oh. So I, I want to say that if, you, if, if this is difficult for you, I mean, <laughs> I mean, geez, you know. I, I went not. <laughs> I went 26 months on that puppy, and it's the most reproduced photo in the history of photography, and nobody could get it, you know? Um, and then uh, something about uh, editorials. You know, the Huffington Post and the Daily Beast, mm. it's amazing because you can uh, establish your own uh, uh, page there, put your picture up like you're a real adult, like you're an expert, <laughs> and then you can write an op-ed that's related to something you're writing about. And, you know, maybe nobody reads it, but you can link it to your website, and you look important. You look like an, <laughs> you know, you look like an adult. JamesBradley.com. I you know, see my yeah. op, see my op-ed at the Daily Did Beast. Oh, this guy's got you know Daily page. Beast. Yeah. Yeah. You go to Nobody Daily Beast. You see my picture. There's an opinion. So you write the op-ed, but you wind it around to yourself, right. and you look like an adult. And they will, they will take anyone in the Huffington Post. They took me, so but they, they really will. And of course, but you it know, looks it's, important. It, it sure you know, does. It looks bigger than Darn, it is. Peacock effect is huge. Absolutely. Very important. Never forget that. You, if you're writing about someone in in the psychology field at all, Psychology Today will allow you to blog, and you know, it, it is much better to blog for an established place that already has eyeballs than to create your own blog and also in addition to writing the pieces have to work to get the eyeballs there so very smart to go for our Huffington Post such good tips. How do you get up writing Wikipedia articles? Do you know, that, I mean with biography you hear the name Henry Ward Beecher I've heard of this person do you go straight to I did go and add my book as a reference at every oh, Wikipedia site that made sense. Encyclopedia Sorry. Britannica. That's about all I did. A lot <laughs> yeah, great idea. One trick thing about Wikipedia is that, first of all, it's not even like a blog. Pretty much all of us can go and set up blogs. It's Blogging at this point is essentially like writing an email because there are templates and applications that are designed for those of us who don't really know about technology. WordPress.com is a good one. Right. WordPress, Blogger, Tumblr, it's fairly easy to log on, set it up. Wikipedia is different because you actually need to be able to code in HTML, so which is not that hard when you're talking about brief mentions, you can kind of figure it out, but to set up an entire entry is a little bit trickier. Not that you can't do it, but it's not something that anyone can just go on and do. There are also certain rules. For example, the entry has to be considered important enough. It's quite likely that for historical figures, that will be considered an important entry. Um, but you also have to see if the entry already exists, so maybe it's a case of adding your book to that entry. In some cases, it may be that there is no Wikipedia entry for that historical fi figure, so if you can start it, you can try that. But there is also a risk of articles being considered stubs um, and not having enough information. Sometimes those do get taken down Another rule is that you're really not supposed to be creating an entry for yourself. So that I would advise against. Also, you know, you may be thinking, well, should I create an entry for the book? Again, that often a book isn't considered important, even though certainly all of us would consider <laughs> the books important to the Wikipedia community that doesn't usually pass muster. There are certainly 
um, exceptions to that rule, but that can be a tricky situation. So my advice would be given that, you know, all of you are writing or trying to write biographies of historical figures to go for the figure rather than for the book. So in my case, there's actually a really bad article about my subject. Is it worth my time at this stage to go in and write a fuller article, a more accurate article? You won't be able, or if you write a different article, you risk it being taken down because it already exists. So if something already exists, what you want to do is change that article. However, you need to be able to justify your changes and say why you've made that change. And if you look at every Wikipedia article, there is a log of what's been changed. And sometimes people get very testy about the changes, and then you get editing wars, and it gets very <laughs> complex. But that's not Who is your subject? Marianne Moore. Oh. oh. Well, it might be worth your while to consider writing somewhere else about the mistakes in the Wikipedia article. In other words, drawing attention to your expertise, not anonymously, but under your own. But see, I, no, I think I, I would go to the original article. So that's the, what people use. Edited. And the more interesting you make your, I did edit Henry Ward Beecher a little bit partially because it wasn't very good and some of the stuff was wrong, but also because I thought, well, the better he looks on Wikipedia, the more people might well, and you don't have to justify it that much. I mean, I have to say, very, it's, unless you're really kind of being controversial, it's, it's really not. Short. I mean, it's right. not. Just so then you it. can add just do it. Just do it. Make it yours. <laughs> and then just make sure to put cite your book. sources. <laughs> <laughs> Any information that's added, it has to have a citation. Right. It all the time. Maybe ignore it as a source when you're doing your research. Go right, <laughs> please, go right to the primary source, but certainly as a promotional yeah. tool, it's excellent. And they've done studies that show that Wikipedia was something like, I think, 95% as accurate as the Encyclopedia Britannica, because what's happening is you don't have one person writing an article. You have an entire community. So those serious mistakes tend to get pushed out over time. Mm -hmm. They can be, unfortunately, yes. And you know, maybe that's where you come in, and if, if you're able to edit it, then you put the other point of view, yeah. because Wikipedia is supposed to be neutral. It's not always, but it's supposed or to be. Or describe the controversy. You know, yeah. that's sometimes mm -hmm. really good. Um, Debbie and James, do you have any idea how many galleys were sent out of your books, and did you have any ability Not unless uh, I particularly wanted them to get galleys, and that was maybe two people who I interviewed for the book who I thought needed to know about what was in it in advance. I think that well, maybe 200 sets of galleys were sent out, um, and maybe more than that. Uh, they were very, they were very generous with the uh, number of galleys and then later on finished books that they sent. That's when they're going to be generous. They'll stop being generous very quickly after the publication. It's true. So you want to ask for as much as you can by giving them the opportunity. I have 200 people who should get this, and they will be reasonably excited at that point. That's that you, right. That you, that's true, James. Even if you don't know these people, if you make lists of people you think should get the books, um, that can be greeted with some degree of skepticism, but also some degree of gratitude because they're thinking. We, we learn very quickly which authors really have connections and good ideas, and they really are people who should get a galley or a finished book, and which authors have kind of grandiose ideas of, oh, send it to Obama. <laughs> <laughs> um, your we do usually three to 400 galleys per biography. Mm -hmm. It depends on you know how substantial that, that person is because our thinking is, um, 
get to them nice and early. The, the most heartbreaking thing for a publicist is to hear, oh gosh, I would have covered this, but I got the material on it too late. You know, just by getting the finished book, it was too late for my lead time or my planning time. So we do three to 400 galleys, and then we send a finished book to almost everyone we sent a galley to, with the exception of some of those long lead magazines whose, you know, their time has come and gone. Um, and then we try to be as generous as we can be with finished books. It is actually easier for us to be generous with finished books than it is for us to be generous with galleys because the unit cost on a galley, even though they look kind of crappy compared to a finished book, is actually quite a bit higher than the unit cost on a finished book because of the number that we're printing. And I, I don't know how many galleys were sent. I, I, maybe I did, but I can't remember. Um, but I think you gotta have guts, and you know, like we're talking, should I do the Wikipedia? I mean, do the Wikipedia. Just, that's done. Everything you know. I I don't know. I did not know the publisher of the New York Times, and I took the Imper I took a galley of the Imperial Cruise, and I looked up his address, you know, his <coughs> spelling, and I said, Dear Arthur, <laughs> I think this book is right up your line. Uh -huh. Sincerely, James Bradley. Well, I sent it to my former uh, Japanese history professor. He can't remember getting it. You know what I mean? Right. I sent it to Arthur Sulzberger, and he writes me back a lot. Oh, I love the book. And so yeah. you don't know. You know, you don't know. But don't think of, I mean, just do it yeah. and get it out there. Because, because these are all humans. Like you were talking about uh, uh, Blurby, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, to approach her and send, oh, my God, will she? No, send it. But She's do a write human. it, but it's better if you write a nice note. I gotta say, and write a note. And it makes a big difference. And I will say, I wish I gave my publisher a list of galleys to send out. I wish that I had got and books, and then later books that I had follow. I wanted him to do the sending because that's a big that task, and that's Expensive. how they do it. But I should have sent there are at least I wish now about a dozen or two dozen letters I had sent follow up personal letters because I think they would have been more likely to really pay attention they read them. to it. They they do. People yeah. love to get actual mail rather than email, so that's always. And a good people thing like to, to be do. flattered. It's ridiculous. They really do. <laughs> they never get tired of it. No, but <laughs> I speak personally. <laughs> but think of how many snail mail letters you're getting right now. You know, not a lot. And then think about how many really nice snail mail letters you're getting with a nice book. Yeah, that was one of the things my husband just said. Immediately, you have to go make nice stationery. Which I was like, really? What? I became so fancy. I need nice stationery with my name on it. But it makes a difference. People say, oh, I got that what elegant yes, letter from you. Yes. <laughs> really? I have a question uh, about Blur. If you approach somebody who is Blur for you, do you expect them to read the book? No. <laughs> I'll be honest Some about this. It. It's a game Some people play. I mean, sure, you hope. But I have had, I mean, when I have sent out a manuscript as an editor for my author and said, would you be willing to blurb this book? Some people have gotten back to me and said, well, I, I lovely topic, you know, seems like a great author, but I don't have time. And I said, oh, well, what if I wrote the blurb for you? <laughs> and then you could read enough of the book to feel comfortable putting your name to it. And, and some of them say, no, I'm not comfortable with that. And others say, oh, that'd be great. Thanks. So should you send a, um, a summary? Yes, of the book? yes. And the blurb request? Yeah, for sure. Or at yeah, least a cover letter that oh, describes the book really well. I mean, oh my God. Like a, you know, you know just a little bit. Dear Joe, you right, will like letter. the fact that, right. what will they like? Right. You right. will be excited by, readers will, right. you know, active. Mm -hmm. Tell them why they will like it. Give them the verbiage and the adjectives that you would like them to blurb you with. You know, here's a, uh, I include a summary of the book. I mean, oh my God. Let's yeah, fall asleep. You know, this is why you'll like but it. But something, though, that'll make you feel like yeah, No, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing yeah. the summary, yeah. but I'm yeah. writing yeah. it, and I'm personalizing yeah. it to you. And the reason, you know, you're from Louisiana, and there's a Louisiana thing yeah. here, or you're from, you know, North Dakota, or you're in this business, or pers take that summary and personalize it to the person. Can I, can I ask a follow-up to that? Because I never saw the letter my editor sent to the Bound Galley, and I was really frustrated because I think more along your lines, and I don't know what she sent. Can certainly ask to see Depends it. Depends on the editor. Some the, people are touchy. You can certainly ask. The thing I will tell you is your name goes on the book. You have final say in what goes in that book. If their name goes on the letter and it's their signature at the bottom or the publicist's contact information goes on the press release, ultimately it is their document. They get to have final well, edit I understand that. Isn't the author a resource? 
you know, absolutely. If you want to influence your editor, yeah. I have found uh, better to gently, sweetly give them some text. I thought I would help you, and then they can reject it. But they're busy; they're just as happy to adopt the text well, that you she give. She has some text, but I don't know what she used. Right. But I, I ask will, her for a copy. Yeah, you sure? Yeah. You, you can just say I'd love to have it for my files. I'm a pack rat. I <laughs> save everything. And then say, Oh, I noticed. You know, there was a date that was wrong on this. You know, or you know, I love. The beginning and the end, and I wonder if in the middle we would want to say this instead. Just put it in the form of a question, just like your hopefully very nice editor, you know, in the margins. But do you really want to phrase it that way? Question mark, which of course means don't phrase it that way. So yeah, but absolutely, and and frankly, you know, I I don't read every book cover to cover by any no. means when I publicize it. So I am, if I have an author who seems normal and sane and prompt and lovely and nice, I would be great. Which luckily sometimes I do. Not always. I, I would love to give them my galley letter, my press release, and say, can you vet this for me? Can you make sure that if I'm saying that so-and-so was the first person to ever do X, Y, and Z, that they really were the first person to do X, Y, and Z? And you'd hope I'd have my act together, and I usually do. But just in case, another set of eyes, someone who really, really knows the material, I'm grateful. And then just one thing to keep in mind with blurbs is that if someone blurbs your book, they're not going to review it. Great point. So if yes. you're going to people who are going to people for blurbs who are journalists or who you know write reviews for papers, you just think a bit about who you want to blurb it and who should maybe be on the review. In fact, tragically, I offered to blurb Jamie McGrath Morris's uh, book on Pulitzer and was asked by the New York Times to review it a couple weeks or yeah. a month later and oh. couldn't do it. Bing West reviewed a book called Kaboom for us for the Wall Street Journal and we sent him the manuscript and said, would you like to blurb this? And he said, actually, I'd like to review it instead. Let me call Eric Eichmann, the book yeah, review editor at the Wall Street Journal for you and see if he'll let oh, me. Great. Oh. great. So. I just, uh, I'm an editor at Henry Fold, and I wanted to tell some of you that one of the things, I'm very aggressive about working with my authors to get blurbs for, you know, reason all of these mentioned. I think it's really helpful when it comes to trying to get reviews and whatnot um, to go in there with a lot of ammunition. Um, but what I often do, and a lot of editors I know do this, and then other editors don't, obviously it depends on how full our dockets are, we're very overworked <laughs> to begin with, but um, the minute I have a finished manuscript that I'm sending to copy editing, I will get bound manuscripts made at Kinko's. I'll have to send my assistant over there and get about 20 bound manuscripts made with the hopes of doing a blurb mailing at that stage to get, I, I love to see about three good blurbs on the galleys themselves. Because mm -hmm. that's Great idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. and bloggers and whoever are going to see. And at that point, you know, usually, um, depending on how schedule, I might have galleys uh, to use for blur purposes before the publicist goes out with them, just depending on the media sort of timeline. And the publicist might have additional blurbs to use then, you know, in her cover letter sure. introducing the book. But I think it's just helpful on the book itself to have blurbs there. And I think it's, it's about writing a very targeted letter. I think a lot of the people I approach get a they get a hundred of these yeah, a year. I have a book right now that's not a biography, but it's a memoir called Mennonite in a Little Black Dress, and it's number one right now on mm -hmm. the Boston Globe and the Times. And the, that was a little book when I when we just bought it. You know, not a lot of money, a book that I felt like not a lot of people were going to pay attention to, and I just loved it. And the person I really wanted to read this book and blurb it was Elizabeth Gilbert. And I knew her, she was so overwhelmed and equally loved it been so big, um, but, and she was finishing her second book, but her editor wouldn't pass it along along the band manuscript. So I remember that she was dating this guy who's now her husband and committed, um, who's from Brazil and has kind of a crazy last name. And I remember reading in an interview that he had opened an antique store in New Jersey. <laughs> this is the kind of person we need. Yeah, a ball editor. <laughs> I can't blurb, I have to finish committed. I sat down last week to send you an email to say thanks very much for sending this to me, but I can't, I don't have the time to read it. But before I click send, I turned to the first page. Yeah. And that was the book, the, the blurb that got our sales force to pay attention to the book. Mm -hmm. The blurbs are a lot about, again, it has to be the right blurb for the right book. Sometimes you get these blurbs and 
But don't you feel some of it is to speak a little crudely, it's a little bit cover your backside? Because I find that I'm more likely to blurb something if I feel like, oh, somebody I already respect thinks it's a pretty good thing. And also, I have to say this, I, I sat on, I had the privilege of sitting on the Pulitzer uh, Committee for Autobiography and Biography a few years ago. And even there, when you, you we had 700 books, and you have to start deciding which am I going to read first. And frankly, the books that had the better blurbs, that looked more professional, that looked better set up, it was easier to start with those books. Not that that was the only thing. We did read them, but it really, and, it, and when we went to, because the way the Pulitzer works is you, the individual, you have a, th a panel of three, that, but the, you don't decide. You only give the three top choices to the large Pulitzer panel. And frankly, this goes back maybe to the, the ultimate, it's not the ultimate marketing thing, but it is perhaps the most important that James said, is that a good book, uh, a short book, it, it is perhaps the best marketing thing you can do to yourself mm -hmm. is, is listen to your editor when they say cut. In fact, exceed your editor's yeah. instructions. Cut, cut, cut. I, we had a number of great biographies that I thought really were worth both in subject and writing style were, and research were all worth the attention. I could not convince my fellow jurors to take them seriously because they were just too big for what they considered the worth of the subject. Okay, yes, this on FDR. I don't know why we need another big book on FDR like that, but okay, they would be willing to consider that. That much on Ida Tarbell, uh, you know, was a little hard for them. and. It's silly and it's shameful since you're going to spend your life doing this, but it but it makes the difference. A shorter book. But the other thing about blurbs that I want to add is what it can do when they come in before publication. It enables the editor to keep the conversation going in house yeah. about the book. It's about me sending another email to my colleague, my publisher, the publicists, the marketing people to say, "Hey, look, more good stuff is happening for this," and we are so deluged with um, our own projects. Can I comment on that? Yeah. So we were talking about, you know, should I send a summary and whatever. Did you notice in this story, in the middle of the story, she got two sentences to Elizabeth Gilbert? <laughs> no, but did you hear those sentences? Yeah. Yeah. And how long that took yeah. to do that? So she worked with paragraphs and paragraphs, right? Yes. And you were desperate and letter. you got it. Gran Torino with Clint Eastwood, that's how that got made. It couldn't get through the agent, it didn't get to him this way, it didn't get to him this way. And he went through some deli guy that got it to somebody <laughs> who knew. But, but he, they narrowed it down to those two sentences. So that's the summary you need. The sum, it's, about, it's about making the person who's receiving this book. It's a huge imposition on their time that they actually do read it. It's usually someone, if they're a big enough person, they're working on their own book and they're being asked. Like, but make them feel special and make them feel like I'm sending you this letter. Nobody else got this letter that Elizabeth Gilbert got. And, you know, yeah. <coughs> like uh, you sent uh, letters and books aside from what your editor was doing. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, the editor, like this last one, the editor uh, did their own thing. When you talk about, uh, you know, what letter did they send, I probably submitted to the uh, publicist 11 different letters. Here's what you could send to the Korean market. Here's what you can send to the Filipinos. Oh, gee, I had an idea that you could send. So I worked for weeks writing up these potential letters, these, these two-sentence things, and just submitted to, you know, oh, I just, I was just thinking, you know, I made it sound like I just did this quickly, but I worked for weeks on but this uh, stuff, submitted it to the publicist, and then I asked the publicist for a certain amount of books, I can't remember how many, and then I did my own personal handwritten stuff. Yeah, you should ask for as many books as they'll give you at the beginning, because mm -hmm. they won't give them Get later. it written into your contract, mm -hmm. too. You know, yeah. if, if their standard number of books is 20 books, ask your agent to see if they'd give you 50 instead. And I should say on the blurbs, I had maybe a dozen blurbs. My, my editor got one, and I got the rest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty common. Yeah. Um, just parenthetically, I found that often I get requests for how do you find an agent if you go way back to the beginning of this. And it, it, it's worked for most people I've said it to, is to look at what sort of books the agent has mm -hmm. published. Mm -hmm. And then you write a very targeted letter just like that, saying, I've seen that you've already done this kind of book, and I'm working on a similar book, mm -hmm. and I think you'd be interested. 
and it shows the agent as <coughs> true of what you're saying here that you've done your homework and you've targeted on them and you flatter them by saying, you know, this is something that I think you'll be interested in. Although I'm more, I, it's better to know what they're working on now because I'm now much more interested in taking a look for my own purposes at books about the 1920s than I am about the 1840s. And so I'm much more likely to, and it's good for me to move into that. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps to know what they're doing now. Um, I've heard many tales of publicists um, feeling, I can't bear this author phoning me again, bothering <laughs> me again. What is the fine art of being a good, effective author advocate within the publishing I'm so glad you're even asking that question because so many authors never even think about the relationship that they have with their publicist. Publishing is a business of relationships. You're going to have a relationship with your agent, with your editor, with your publicist. It's as important as your relationship with your agent and your editor. Um, you know, simply saying to them, what can I do to help you? What am I not doing that I should be doing? Do you want me to come up with a canned Q&A that you can use as part of your press material? Do you want me, like James did, to come up with a separate pitch for each different possible audience for the book and send it to you so that you can cut and paste it into emails when you're following up with the media? Um, do you want me to set up my own events at local libraries and historical societies, or do you want to do that? You know, just having that candid conversation with them about how you can be helpful is tremendous. Um, sending them links to any reviews of your book that you see, saying thank you when they send you <laughs> links, or when they get a big radio or television booking for you or set up a great event for you. And also just communication, keeping them informed. You know, it was a great event, you know, slightly lighter turnout than I think either of us were hoping, but um, fabulous questions from the audience. And hey, more than, you know, three quarters of the people who showed up actually purchased the book afterward. Um, one thing to be cognizant of is sending too many emails on any given day. <laughs> um, so, you know, two, three, four a day when things are really popping for the book, that's fine. You know, when I come in on a Monday morning and I have 10 emails from over the weekend from the same author and their book was published three months ago, <laughs> I want to cry. <laughs> um, you know, also being respectful to some degree of their personal space. I mean, I give all of my authors my cell phone number, especially if they're going to be touring, you know, flights get canceled, it screws up the whole day's media for the next day. They need to be able to reach me, I get that, but I do have other authors who take advantage of that when I'm driving to work at 7.30 in the morning and they're already, already on the phone saying, so I have this idea of an op-ed I could write, what do you think? I think you should call me again at 9 o'clock once I'm in the office. So do respect, you know, some boundaries. Um, and, and be accessible to them. If you don't have a cell phone, get a cell phone. If you don't use email, use email. You'd be surprised to have some authors who don't use email. It makes it much harder for me to communicate with them. And one quick thing that saves a lot of time, we, we've all been talking about, if you do have contacts, pass them on to the publicist, is that if you are passing on a lot of contacts, please pass them on in Excel rather than simply typing them up in Word or an email. We all use databases and Excel or really any kind of database program. We can just dump all of that into our database and our labels come right out. I once had an agent send me 20 pages of addresses and you can imagine how long that took to input into the system. Also, realistically, if, you know, think about it from, if you were to get labels, how quickly would you mail that out? Probably pretty quickly, because you just have the labels. If you got the addresses, and they had to be input by hand into a system or copied and pasted, when would it get sent out? Probably when there's time to send it out, which could be anywhere between now and never. <laughs> so, it, gets, it gets worse than that even. I get the, you know, so-and-so, I think he teaches at the University of whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or such and such, um, she writes for the New York Times, I think. <laughs> so, you know, address. And email address and phone number for them if you have it so we can follow up. In Excel, that's a great idea. I've never asked for that, but I'm still in <laughs> <Now you have. laughs> and, and, and you can use common sense. You know, if you're only passing on two addresses, do you have to create an Excel document? No. But if you are sending, you know, 10, 20, 30, then it is much easier if we get it in Excel. How many of you know Excel and use it? It's not that hard. <laughs> Ask your kids. You know, I, I want to say Jay Leno has an agent, right? 
And Jay Leno has a publicist. But Jay Leno is working his ass off all the time <laughs> on making his own act better. So you can do all these techniques. And if you are rehearsing every day aloud about what you are going to say, you're going to find nuggets in those rehearsals that you can then pass on to that poor publicist who's got 15 of you calling. <laughs> And you got the hot nugget because you're one of the few who's rehearsing aloud. You're better on the phone. You're better when you talk to the public, you know, to somebody down the line. So, you know, make your own product better out of what's coming out of your own mouth so they have something hot to sell. And easy to deal with. And, yeah, and easy to, to deal with. Man, I send gifts to my publicist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Postcards. I, thank I you. I can count on one hand the number of authors who've. I, one woman, Barbara Freeze, wrote an amazing book about coal. She sent me homemade macaroons in this cute little old cigar box. <laughs> I will remember that until the day I die. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I'm not saying you have to all these guys flowers and send us no, gifts, but, you know but I remember it. I work yeah. harder for them. I'm human. You know, we're influenced by that. My, my <laughs> last publicist, I, I couldn't believe how many times she said, I would say, you know, I will do something. And she said, oh, you will? Oh, that would, <laughs> that would be great if you, and I realized that she must have authors calling her, like, you know, what are you doing for me? I'm sitting here like a limp noodle. How come I don't have a whatever? You know, so I was proactive with my publicist, and she thanked me so much, and I realized, oh, wow, the other authors are not doing this. It's true. And I'm certainly not going to disagree with Debbie and say, oh, sorry, with uh, Melissa, and say that, you know, we don't like gifts, because we do. <laughs> but, like, we're human. On the other hand, you know, we're not asking all our authors to send us stuff. <laughs> and sometimes, oh send it to me. <laughs> sometimes it advice. really just is a case of saying, Thank you. I appreciate yeah. your work. What can I do for you? You know, that in itself is a gift for us. It is. And we don't get them often. <laughs> thank yous, honestly. We don't. I think you get beat up a lot is what uh, the oh, idea sure. is. Yeah. And the expectation. This is a tough line. job. And you know what? Remember, you want that. Like, if your publicist is short with you, if she's saying, I'm sorry, I don't have time to, you know, to speak with you for a half hour about your book. If she speaks with you for a half hour about your book, that's a half hour that she's not following up with the media on behalf of your book. I'm not saying you don't need to talk. Of course you do, but. All right, we have time for a couple of more questions. You had one. Uh, you touched on global marketing issues. Are there any other mm -hmm. comments that you want to make about looking outside of the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where's the money outside the U.S.? Right. Where is it? Is it? India, no, been, China. Yeah, but do you make any money out of China and India? Well, I, I'm being published right now in India. It's selling pretty well. Yeah, I am too. I mean, I've. I've been published overseas for years. Yeah. I mean, I get I the two thousand dollars for the rights and never see any other money again. I don't know, but I, th I think I'm in like seventeen different countries. I mean, it's a huge got speaking as a Dutch man. Uh, I can answer that uh, question. Uh, There's a simple here in the nation. I mean, I just sold the book um, in Britain and America. And we well, that's got, a different country. But we got more in Korea and Japan, British guy than what mm. we got in America and Britain. So it varies from book to book. Um, the question I'd ask is also about prizes. Well, I can just say it went from nice, got a, got a lot of great reviews and hustled and got, I felt good, but it really made the difference between uh, the book having a lovely little rollout and dying nicely, mm -hmm. uh, gently, gracefully, uh, and, or, and living. And, and I have, I can say, I just got a royalty statement, I have sold like 30,401 copies, something like that. Now, that is by no means... There's nothing to live on. I have not actually seen a royalty check, but that is enough that my that you know my publisher wants to publish another book. And even if I had sold less than that, I think the prize would have made the difference. And I I think it does. I mean, it, it depends. Does. It even does. little prizes help. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, I did a study. Uh, oh, you wrote a whole book at, about this. At, yeah, um, I have a fellowship at Columbia General School in Philadelphia, and we study prize winners and bestsellers. Um, and the Pulitzer is the best one. In terms of upping sales. Better than National Book Award? It certainly was then, and I think it still is now. I don't think I'll make a note to give it. Keep it anyway, short. <laughs> it's, it's better now than it used to be. The, I'm sorry, the, the, the National Book Award. It, it didn't used to be that effective, but it's better. Mm -hmm. Now, it can make a big difference. Go for those. Um, of course, the Booker Prize, 
Mm -hmm. But yes. know, the pen awards. But I will tell you too, you absolutely go for those biggies. I mean, make sure that your publicist or your editor or your marketing department, whoever it is at your particular publisher that's responsible for entering books for awards, make sure they've entered you for those biggies. Mm -hmm. But also go for the niche ones. Go for the local ones. Mm -hmm. Go for you know a, an award that is just for books about um, African Americans, yeah. you know, that were that yeah. lived from the 1800s to mm -hmm. the you know really small. It lets you feel ones. more successful. You are more successful, and it gives you a longer career because really you have to play this game for the long run. Yeah, and there are a lot of best books lists at the end of the year, and I do think those help a lot. Yeah. And uh, if you include them in your publicity material yeah. for the paperback, I think it probably helps. Great point. Yep. Thank you so much to our distinguished mm -hmm. friends.